Mapperton House in West Dorset has been the ancestral seat of the Earls of Sandwich since the 1950s, when the Montague family moved here from Hinchingbrook House in Cambridgeshire. This part of Dorset has always held a very special place in the family's history. So I head to the archives to trace the origins of the Montagues and explore our ties to this beautiful part of Britain. When I married into the British aristocracy, it was the start of a wonderfully exciting journey, but it was also a little daunting. I became a Viscountess, and for an American girl from a small town outside Chicago, that was quite a shock. I live with my husband, Luke, heir to the Earl of Sandwich, and our family at Mapperton House in Dorset. Living in a place like this is a joy, but also a challenge. And every day we're aware that we're preserving a very special part of Britain's heritage. Mapperton has opened up an extraordinary new world for me, and I can't wait to share it with you all. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Well, here I am again looking through the archives, but I've brought in a special guest you, my husband, because I'm hoping you can help me with something. It's, you know, your family is just, it's like this journey of discovery. Every time I head into the muniment room or open up a letter or find a book, I have more and more questions. And so today I'm hoping you can help me. I found this book that was made for your uh, great grandfather, George Montague, the ninth Earl of Sandwich by his sister. And it's fantastic. These ancestral tablets. I mean, it's beautiful. It's a work of art. Have you seen these before? I have never seen oh. this before and, and, um, until, you've, until you've shown me. And what seems extraordinary about it is the time that Olga, who was the sister of my great-grandfather, spent putting it together. Because it doesn't just trace our family tree, it has all the related branches of other families and, and it shows the kind of interconnectedness and it does it in 3d because you've got these little windows it's here incredible. where you can see through and have people in multiple on multiple pages so that so that you're understanding the connection you're understanding yeah. the other family trees because everybody wants to show off the fact that they're connected with all these other aristocratic families you can see that we've got the hardwicks earls of hardwicks we've got the duke of bolton on another page so you know all these we, sort of shields the, here don't you well i know some of them <laughs> um but what's so fascinating about what you've uncovered here is the lineage going back beyond the first earl of sandwich the earls of sandwich began as we know in the 1600s exactly but obviously the monty family goes back much further than that in fact we go back all the way to william the conqueror and if you trace back what we can see on this page, yes. you can see we've got Sydney, then we've got Edwards, Thomas, Richard, William. All these Montagues. There's but generations of Montagues going all the way back yes. um, to the time of, of Henry III. And you've got William Montacute. Yes, so I can see where the name changes. So I see Montague, Montague, Montague. And then there's a... It's, it starts to become Montacute. What you've yes. got to remember is that in those days, spelling was there was a lot of variation a lot of fluidity right know, montague probably came from montacute and vice versa sometimes there was an e on the end sometimes there wasn't but what's interesting about this is that we get back to william montacute now he i believe was the grandson of somebody called drogo de montague and drogo de montague was a French nobleman who came over with William the Conqueror right. from Normandy. And there is a place in Normandy called Montaigu-les-Bois, which, which means Montagu of the woods. Right. And Montaigu in French, Mont, uh, hill, yes. mountain. Aigu, sharp, sharp hill. So Drogo um, de Montaigu came over, right. but the story gets really complicated because he came over with William the Conqueror. In 
Give me a year. In 1066. Thank you. And as part of the Norman Conquest, um, William the Conqueror was William Duke of Normandy. Yes. And he was best friends with Robert, who was the Count of either Montaigne or Moriton, again, a name that was spelled in different ways. And that chap, Robert, was given the town, the area around what is now Montacute. Which is very near to here. Which is very near to here. Yes. Drogo was given land in Somerset, near somewhere now called Shepton Montague. Oh my, which again, but, is still near to here. But this other chap, Robert, eventually gave Drogo de Montague, Montacute, oh my and a goodness. place called St. Michael's Hill. And St. Michael's Hill is also a pointy hill. Right. So you've got a pointy hill in France, and you've got a pointy hill in Somerset, and somewhere between those two pointy hills is the origin of the name Montague. Montague. Well, but, but what's most fascinating, of course, is that one of those pointy hills is quite close to here, and yes. we've never been. So you're telling me right now, now that I can trace this back, that really that is the place in Somerset could be the origin, if you like, of Montagues as we know it today. I think it almost certainly is. <laughs> <laughs>
And this was, of course, the site of the original Malt and Bailey Castle, which was built right after the Norman Conquest. And those Normans, they were clever. They chose this spot to showcase their political presence, but also this is the perfect vantage point right here. Now, standing behind me, this tower was built in the 18th century. However, over the years, the castle decayed and the last thing that was kept standing was the chapel, but that decayed as well in the 16th century, it was gone. So in its place in the 18th century was built this folly. And I can see a door, an entrance, it's open, so I'm gonna head on up. For me, it was so amazing to stand on the site of the original Norman Castle Keep and see where the Montague family originated from in the 11th century. I cannot believe it, but yes, the Montague name technically is 1,000 years old. Not far from Mapperton, across the fields in this beautiful corner of West Dorset is the estate of Hook Court. This estate was once owned by the Montague family. Many of you know that we had to leave the family ancestral seat, Hinchingbrook House, in 1955, and we ended up here in Dorset. But why? Well, there is a reason why, and all is explained by my father-in-law. Well, this is very exciting because we are in the newly decorated, renovated uh, muniment room, which is the archive room. And I cannot believe it's the same room it was. <laughs> it's completely transformed. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful and it's comfortable as well. So around us we have now uh, a lot of the archives of the family and one of the archives that I came across when I was moving things out and then back in is of course this connection that Mapperton now has, if you like, the Montague family here at Mapperton has had with Dorset. And that is because of what's called the Bolton Estates. And can you explain that to me a little bit more about how this land, I think it was about 5,000 acres at one point, which is adjacent to Mapperton, came into the hands of the Montagues? Yes, I mean, it was originally the fifth Earl of Sandwiches. Uh, marriage that brought that Hook estate in, but they didn't have it um, for all sorts of reasons, tangles with lawyers and so on. Right. And th there were two sisters, uh, twin, not twins, but two, two inherit who inherited the estate, and that's why it took almost a hundred years for it to become properly partitioned, and the part that uh, was inherited uh, was the Hook Estate. Was the Hook Estate. And, and I've seen all of the uh, coat of arms at Hinchingbrook in the library where it's impaled because you would want to marry somebody of a noble family. So the fifth Earl married, was it the Duke of Bolton's daughter, a so noble family? Mary Paulet, yes, that's right. Um, and the Duke of Cleveland was the other. A f part of the family, and, uh, and, and it was his daughter who was the other heiress. And it, it really is it's still too confusing to describe. <laughs> but the important thing is we, we didn't get some of it. We got Hook Estate. And I think Devon was the area of m much of the rest of the property. Right. Devon and further north into Somerset. Right. So, so the fifth Earl, we can say in one sense, married a Dorset Devon girl is that correct that's right that's she, but she was certainly connected but it was also around hampshire and basingstoke we call it now old basing house yes it was became a, a also was a poor headquarters but right. that was that was not in the family that went, went separately 
So the fifth Earl, and might I add is, I always like to say this, was the fourth Earl's son, the fourth Earl who is, uh, you know, probably More well the, known. Yeah. Is very well known. He marries the Duke of Bolton's daughter, Mary Pollitt. And here, what I have found is the Bolton estate. I found this as I was putting the archives back. No, and this, of course, describes uh, what was in the Bolton estates. And if I just go to the summary page, you can see here, there is where Hook is, is mentioned. And I recognize a couple of these farms because I think they're still part of Mapperton Estate. Is that right? Well, it, it, running down the list, um, obviously, Hook is no longer itself part of it, or Toller. Right. But we have, we have retained Northport and, and some of Powerstock and some of Witherston. Yes. So I just thought that was um, wonderful just to see this and then and to make sense that there is a connection and it really a long association of the Montague family down here in Dorset. Um, well, we go back to 1760s, that sort of time, the, the marriage of the fourth, fourth Earl's son, John the Fifth Earl. I am planning on visiting Hook because the building is still intact, it's beautiful, and I think that's where when we look at this visitor's book, and I found Alberta's name, uh, must have been her first visit in 1906, one year after she married George, oh, yeah. but they would stay in that building. And that's what I wanted to ask you. There are sort of carvings of not only the carvings from Duke of Bolton and perhaps those three swords, but are there sandwich carvings as well? Well, they, they were brought together in the, in the shield. I think that was why. Oh, my Can I goodness. Can I just have a look at this? Yes, of course. Oh, well, i is Which is Alberta's? Right here. So, Alberta Montague, October 2nd to the 15th. Oh, that's amazing. So, that was her first entry. That was her first entry. Yeah. So, I do feel that Alberta even has a presence here as well. You know, she was, she was coming to Dorset, and we can see from this, from this book. But Hook, I think, was really only a shooting home for them. They, it was a second home from Hinchingbrook, and they would invite the sort of families who had shotguns and came for maybe only two days and got back again. Right. And it, it was um, important um, as a staging post, but it was never a senior property for the family. I will let you know what I find when I go and visit Hook Court and I'll be sure to take some photographs for you as well, especially if I can find sort of the Bolton and Sandwich Montague together, um, together. Yes. yes. Here in the Staircase Hall at Mapperton, right behind me, is a gorgeous painting of Alberta Sturgis, the Ninth Countess of Sandwich. And it was painted by Ambrose McAvoy, who was considered the society painter of the early 20th century. And every time I walk around the Staircase Hall, I feel that Alberta's watching over me. I recently came across this letter in the archives that Honestly, I was so excited about. And she wrote this while she was at Hook Court. So you can see the letter had says Hook Court. It's October 12th, soon after her marriage to George Montague. And she wrote it to her, my beloved brother, Hollister. She writes, this is such a heavenly country, very hilly, high hedges that almost meet one's head, now black, with blackberries and such lovely thatched villages. She then continues to write, I met yesterday our neighbors at Mapperton Court, about four miles from here. Never in all my life have I seen a small Elizabethan home so beautiful. She continues, all old oak and wood paneling diamond panes, creepers outlining every window, clematis, lavender, and honeysuckle. And when I found this letter, I, 
there really aren't any words to describe the emotion that I had knowing that Alberta not only had visited Matt Bertin, but also said never in all of her life had she seen a more beautiful Elizabethan manor. So there's a part of me that feels we were meant to be here. Oh my goodness, I have arrived at Hook Court, again, once owned by the Sandwich Montague family, but also, you know, I'm walking where Alberta walked. This is where she stayed. And I now know that, uh, that she stayed here in 1906. The first time she came here was, of course, referencing uh, the letter that she left us was in October 1906 when she wrote to her brother and saying what a heavenly country it is. Now, what's interesting, what I see um, right away is the Duke of Bolton's uh, coat of arms right there. So it has the um, three swords and very, very weathered as you can see, but definitely you can make them out. So that's fascinating to see that. And just looking around the building, these windows, beautiful. And the color of the stone is very similar to Mattberton. And this does represent the stone around West Dorset. But I am looking for any other carvings that would, you know, tell me that the Sandwich family Montagues were here. Now I do, there we go, there we go, there we go. I was about to say, I do know that the eighth Earl of Sandwich, who came here again with King Edward VII, he liked to show off his power, in particular at uh, Hinching Brook. There's a lot of his uh, markings there. And lo and behold, we have found one here. Uh, you can see Sandwich and of course showing. Uh, there are the five sort of balls uh, even though a coronet for an earl has eight, when it's facing straight on, you see five of them. And that says uh, 1873, and then with a big S for sandwich. So he did, I know he did a lot of repairs and restorations to Hook Court. I almost feel as if this door uh, Alberta would have walked through this door, absolutely. But it really is beautiful uh, and heavenly country as Alberta described it. I mean, if we just walk over here, there's this lovely pond here and very much like Mapperton, if you like, just kind of in the middle of nowhere, very remote, lots of bird song, uh, beautiful heavenly day and you know, I do wonder if, if I've come across any more letters of Alberta at Hook Court, which I'm sure I will be interesting to see if she swam in here. I mean, as many of you know, I'm a big cold water swimmer, uh, especially at the pool, uh, the 18th century pool at Mattberton. So I do wonder if Alberta was a swimmer herself, but it really is absolutely magical here and I can see why Alberta did enjoy uh, coming here and thought it was uh, splendid, absolutely splendid. Well, I think those are the two markings that I was really looking for. One of the Duke of Bolton and one of the uh, Earl of Sandwich. And they, that's that, that's that marriage and it all sort of happened here. Oh, I might just do a little walking now because I think Alberta would have done that as well. Athelhampton House is a Tudor Manor house in Dorset in Southwest England. In 2019, Giles Keating became its new owner and one of his first restoration projects was to return the kitchen back to its Elizabethan origins. Give it a good stir and then 10, 15 minutes, hopefully we can try it. And then and it's lovely and thick. 
Looking for ways to live in a more sustainable and cost-efficient way in a historic house is a challenge. But at Athel Hampton, this challenge has been met in a new and revolutionary way. You would never guess that these were here. I, I couldn't see them from anywhere in the garden. Welcome to the drawing room here at Mapperton. And this is really the Tudor wing of the house. It was built in 1540s. And in this episode, I'm actually visiting a rather similar and wonderful grade one listed 15th century gem of a Tudor manor house. And it's located in the heart of Dorset. Athel Hampton is about 30 minutes from Mapperton and do you know what's crazy is that I have actually never visited Athelhampton. <laughs> so I'm really excited to see it because it is an extraordinary Tudor building. And if you're like me and you love the history of these buildings, well, you're gonna love this house. But what is even more fascinating is that the owner Giles actually bought Athelhampton in 2019. So it's not one of these houses that's been in the family for hundreds of years. So I'm really excited to see what he's done with Athel Hampton. And personally, I feel that these new historic house homeowners bring their own inspiration and they inject new energy and ideas into these houses. But first, of course, I am really keen to hear more about the history of Athel Hampton. Hello. Kelly, Hello. Great to see you. So, so nice Hi. to you. I've finally made it after all these years. <laughs> it's so good that you're here. I know. It's brilliant. So I was just walking up. Of course, uh, I've seen Athel Hampton photographed all that, but now I'm here in the flesh. I'd love for you to just tell me a little bit about the fabric of the building. It Is that okay? Be a pleasure. I know it's yes. cold, so we won't stay out too Let's long. Let's come and do it. Let's <laughs> go for it. So, okay. So here I mean, we are. Beautiful. Yep. Now, the way I always like to describe this is this part here is the older part, 1485. So the, the wars of the, the end of the Wars of the Roses, Henry VII, the first oh, Tudor. My goodness. And then over there, you've got what I call the modern extension built about 60 years later, the start of Queen Elizabeth I's reign. Right. They, they got a bit of money from knocking down some of the abbeys locally, and that and, was what and they built. And that was it, yeah. and that was what they built. But what are the sort of the men perched on top? So the, the, this is the uh, Martin ape. So the Martins were the family who built this, ah. and the ape is their family symbol. And you'll find it all oh over my. the house, yes. Well, if you're into medieval um, fables, you'll know there's, um, the, the fox, Reynard the fox. Yes. And one of the characters in that is, is Martin's ape, who is actually the kind of the good guy. Um, and, uh, and so, and here, look, you can see you've got the ape oh, at the top of goodness. the tower. And on the other <gasps> side, that's the unicorn. The poor thing has lost its horn. No. Uh, but because the very first Martins who built this married into the Farringdon family and the unicorn was their family symbol. So it's the marriage of the ape and the unicorn. All right, well, this is fascinating, Giles, because it's, I think it's always really interesting, of course, when you come to these houses and to first look outside. Yeah. Because, you know, there's, of course, there's so much going on in the inside, but looking at the fabric of the building and the carvings that were done. I, I, so beautiful, and the stone is all local stone and so on, yes. Yeah, yes. it's just wonderful, brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Well, I can't wait to see what's inside. Come along in, out of the cold, brilliant. come on. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, it really was the most perfect day to see Athel Hampton for my very first time. And once I was inside, Giles was really keen to show me one of his first, and might I say, very big projects. So Julie, here we are in the Elizabethan kitchen. Oh my goodness. 
and then what you see here, this amazing big brick arch. So this is where the, cook, the cooking range. Right. And we've got a spit there for turning and roasting things on. And uh, it's, it's... It's incredible. But can I ask, Giles, when, you know, you, you came here in 2019, is that right? That's right. And yeah. was this one of your first big restoration projects? Absolutely it was. I mean, I think when I first arrived, you know, this was all covered. The bricks were covered in thick layers of paint. We had 1950s kitchen units right the way across. No. Um, a, an old arga that didn't really work very well in the middle, and indeed underneath the arch was all bricked in. Ah, was it? So yes. you, you broke through here? Broke through all of that, and there was some quite complicated engineering to hold it all up. Yeah. So you've restored it back to, of course, the Elizabethan kitchen, what it obviously would have been. And, and it smells amazing, but it also looks like it was. I'm smelling <laughs> something that's Well, I was going to say, let made. me introduce you to Gemma, hi, our hi, head hi. chef. Hi. So Gemma, hi, I Julie. Hi, I hi. so nice to meet you. So now, what are you making here? It smells absolutely amazing. So I'm making Tudor pottage. Right, Tudor pottage. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that recipe. Obviously, it's Tudor, but yeah. it was popular. Yeah, so it's popular. Um, it is made out of uh, vegetables. It's, right. a very, it's a vegetable stew, it's based on a French recipe, I think, originally. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so tell me what vegetables are in so this tra recipe. So traditionally, the, the main recipe that we've sort of grown towards, because it's the most popular one, it has turnips, onions, parsnips, sweet, carrots, which I don't think would have been orange then, but they are right, now, right. obviously. <laughs> um, and lots of herbs and spices come from pepper and things like that, really. And it's thickened with pearl barley or oats. You know, in the Elizabethan time here we were in this big kitchen you know what was happening in this was sort of the heart of the house for all day long it was being used all day long I think that's absolutely spot on I mean obviously this is if you like below stairs yes uh, but though you can imagine maybe the lady of the house would come in from time to time see what's going on uh, chat with the head chef. Right. So I think always a hive of activity, certainly from very early in the morning until late at night, the fire burning away. Right. And of course, over there, you've got the, the, the what I think of as like a hob, where you'd have little fires that would keep things brewing away over yes. there. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so you've got, you always are having a pot on. Something is happening all the time because yeah. you're feeding households, guests, yes. Yes. and, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So it's 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 ongoing, right? So listen, Gemma, I always ask, can I can I lend a helping hand? Absolutely, yeah, always. Yeah, what, what would you like me <laughs> well, to do? We are getting to the stage now where we need to put the pearl barley in because it does take a long time to cook. So okay, we need about a cupful of pearl barley popped into the pan. All right, do do you want me to just guess my cupful? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, okay, just in a normal cupful. I mean, there's a cupful of onions, carrots, um, and sweet in there right now, so you can okay. give them a bit of a guess of, of about a cup. I mean, it, they didn't have a No, they didn't have, they of course didn't have they a, didn't. So we can do okay. whatever you fancy. Are we and happy with that? Yeah, I think that looks good. Perfect. I do love pearl barley. Yeah. And then give it... Give it a good stir. Give it a good stir. And then we'll give it 10 minutes. And then we'll add the, uh, the things that don't need cooking so long, like the leeks, the mushrooms. So prepping here, this is, would have been busy hustle bustle. Yeah. Finish the meal. And then what's the next step? Well, we would uh, serve it through our lovely serving hatches. So I can, we can perhaps have a look at these. We've got essentially here an in-hatch to put the empty plates in. Ah. And then you load them all up along this kind of table here, which they yes. actually called a dresser in Elizabethan times. And then it goes out through the other hatch okay. to be taken, to be served, to be carried through and served in the great hall to the family. Right, so I now understand that is the incoming. Yep. Dirty yep. plates. Exactly, <laughs> yep. And that's the outgoing. Your outgoing, uh, yes. Plated. Yes. But when you were restoring the Elizabethan kitchen, were these two hatches, I mean, they were here originally, but could you see them? So the, the inbound hatch, yes, that had been used in Victorian times. The outbound, the one though, was bricked up. And, you know, we could just about see the outline, but it was bricked. 
Right, right. But from your research, of course, you knew that there would have been an in and an out. Exactly, and yes. Well, we knew there had to be in and out. That was the way it happened in Tudor times and a bit like the way in a modern kitchen as yeah, well. Yeah, no, no, of course, of course. So this was your first big rest restoration project here at Athelhampton. Yes, And yes. it's wonderful and the public can come in. As I said, I've already passed. Um, yep. Many members of the public wanting to come in here, but do you have other restoration projects? You know, you've, you've been here since 2019, so you know you've you're relatively new. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, I mean, obviously, in a Grade One listed house, you're, you you don't have that many, but we have got one other big, exciting one going on at the moment, and that is a window in the Great Hall, which right. has been blocked up for hundreds <gasps> of years, and we are now opening that up. Wow. Yes. Okay, brilliant. Well, I'd love to see that. Love well, to see that. I'm sure Gemma needs your hand a little yeah, bit longer, yeah. but uh, so I'll, I'll perhaps head off, leave you with her, and then meet you up in the Great yeah, Hall. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, I'll meet you at the Great Hall, Giles, and Gemma, do you mind if I just sort of yeah, do absolutely. a little bit more? Okay. Yeah, so um, the Pearl Barley's had its bit of time cooking, so now yeah. we're ready to add all the herbs and stuff, which is all chopped and prepped and ready. Okay. So we're going Fantastic. in. Fantastic. Give it a good stir, and then... 10, 15 minutes, hopefully we can try it. And then it's lovely and thick. I, that's the pearl barley making yeah. that, soaking up all the juice. That is fantastic. We'll give it a bit of a test and see if it needs any more. Oh, it smells so, so delicious. I think it's just like a really, really good vegetable soup, it is. isn't it? It so, is, exactly. Yeah. It's brilliant. Okay, okay. so um, leave this. Yeah. I'll I'm look gonna after go it for yeah. you and you can... Yeah. That'd be amazing. I'll look after it. Okay, I'm gonna go see Giles in the Great Hall, but yeah. mm, it smells incredible. Absolutely yeah, incredible. Excited. But My belly's rumbling already. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, per and perfect on a very cold day, yeah. that's for sure. At the heart of really all of these medieval Tudor manors was always the Great Hall. And Athelhampton's Great Hall, well, it is tremendous. It has been described as one of the finest examples of 15th century domestic architecture in all of England. Oh my goodness. I mean, this is, this is a perfect great hall. I mean, it's, 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 it's intact. In, it's beautiful. You must tell me more because this is astonishing. I mean, this, this hall is very similar to the way it would have been in 1485 when it was built. And, you know, that, and that is such a historic date. I mean, that's the, when the Wars of the Roses come to the end and Henry VII comes to power. The Tudor dynasty begins. Yes. And, you know, it lasts for over 100 years to 1603. When, oh. when, with Queen Elizabeth being the last of the Tudors in the second half of that. Of course, what's caught my eye is the minstrel gallery right there. There definitely was one there when it was right, first built. Right, right, right. But it sort of disappeared over the years. And then that one is uh, it very much as it would have been. And it is a very old one, but from another house. Right, right. So when I walk into the hall, the great hall at these historic houses, you can always tell with the, with the roof, the ceiling right here. But explain to me just this bit because it's absolutely beautiful the way that it's been carved. So yes, yeah, so this is a hammer beam roof, so called because of the shape of these beams. And it, it, it is one of the finest, certainly in the county, perhaps in the country actually. And, and it's pretty well original. It's really, I think, fabulous. It is, I mean, it, I will definitely say it's one of the finest I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot of yes. historic houses. But looking beyond, then I can see windows up there. So, so what you're looking at there, this is our, the kind of latest restoration project. Those windows are original. They go right back to the beginning of the hall, but they have been blocked up for hundreds of no. years. Yes. So we've now, we've just actually unblocked, <gasps> we've taken the wood away. Uh, literally a couple of weeks ago. Oh my goodness! And we're going to we're now going to put some glass in there, and we're going to put in actually uh, we're being a bit bold. Um, we're going me. to put in laser etched glass. 
But so, so when you arrived, 2019, was that, did you know that there was a window there? Was it blocked up? You could tell that there was a window, or was this a later discovery? We could just about tell there was one there, but it was difficult because there was an organ there, but the organ was removed along with the rest of the furniture. Parts of these buildings, fabrics of buildings, when you come to them is so many of them have stained glass and it's almost a lost art these days. But when you arrive at a historic house like yours and you see here they are still intact and I see very much the stained glass. I have this slight obsession with coat of arms. I just, I mean, I probably need to do a whole course on heraldry, I suspect. But I love the way that you can see the impaling and for me, my learning curve as the American who's come over and married into this family was, of course, you know, hundreds of years ago, these noble families would then marry into other noble families. They had to. So then their coat of arms, you know, the, the, the male, would be impaled with the female's family's coat of arms. And I can see that happening there. Absolutely you can. I mean, for example, we were talking earlier about the, the Martins marrying the Farringdons and the Farringdons had the unicorn yes. as their symbol. And you can see that the unicorns there in the middle of that yellow bar with the, with the, the unicorns yes. down the middle of it. And then we talked about the Martin ape, that was the, the family symbol of the Martins. Yes. And if you look at each of those windows, there is the ape at the top of them. I mean, it's fascinating. What I do love about stained glasses is that they tell a story. Always, yes, I, mean, I agree. That's what's so brilliant. And they, you, there's so many different elements to them in each element. Again, you can- The cottage is ready. Oh my goodness. Oh, look, wonderful. I was going to get it. Ooh. Thank you. Wow. Julie, do take a seat, please. Here. This is, do you know, I don't think I've had, I've ever, I'm just trying to think. Of course, I've had veggie stew before, but you know, Elizabethan pottage, maybe not. I don't think not. I've had pottage before. Oh, oh should I need to dish it up? That, oh my goodness, mm. that looks, looks beautiful. Bad, Gemma, thank you. You're quite welcome. Yeah. Thank Would you. Like you, to thank dish you. It up? you yes, yes, please. please. Yes. All right, I'll just remove that. Oh. Fantastic. Just give me a little oh. bit. <gasps> yeah. Okay, Giles, I'll pass these over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Lovely. There you go. Brilliant. Wow. Perhaps if you want some more. Okay, I'm you sure we will. Enjoy your lunch. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. You're welcome. Oh my gosh, it looks wow. delicious. Yeah. Okay. Um, wow. Give it a try. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Mmm. 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 That's it's, great. That it? is brilliant. Perfect on a cold day. It is just say? perfect for it. It really is. Yeah. Oh. It is, and the spices are fantastic. I can really, the rosemary is really coming through. Yep, yep. Mm. No, I think Gemma has done a brilliant job mm. here. And I love the way all the vegetables, oh. you know, can be grown locally, which is just fabulous. I mean, absolutely wonderful. I've also noticed that we are eating on pewter dishes. So this really is the full Elizabethan experience, isn't it? It, it is, yes. <laughs> you know, the, the pot is, uh, um, is, is the, the kind of pot they would have had, the spoon. And as you say, pewter, yeah, yes. definitely. If you think about our kind of backgrounds, you know, we're the new kids on the block. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, it's <laughs> and, a good way to think of yeah, it. Um, for me, one of, I think, the most surprising, uh, I think, revelations is it is difficult to maintain and preserve these historic houses. And I think a lot of times people have this false narrative that we are living like they did in the Downton Abbey age, but yet what we're trying to do is we're not only preserving, you know, this part of England's heritage, but we're also wanting to put our own mark on it. Do you find that as well? I think that's very important. And I mean, by putting your own mark, we don't mean putting up a glass extension. Of course not, but it's sympathetic and harmonic with the building and I think that's very important but yet using modern technology where that's relevant. Well that's exactly where that's relevant and and that's what's so I think wonderful when we were just talking about what you're doing with the you know the new found window which yes, is of course yes. which blocked up for hundreds of years but putting the laser cut yeah. glass on it. Yeah. And the restoration of the window in the Great Hall isn't the only area at Athelhampton where Giles is using the latest technology to revive this Tudor Manor house. 
Athel Hampton is striving to be more sustainable and economical by being the first solar powered manor house in the country. Heating historic homes is one of the greatest challenges house owners face in the 21st century. And when Giles moved to Athel Hampton in 2019, he was faced with the enormous task of heating rooms without insulation or secondary glazing. But he took on this challenge in a new and revolutionary way. Giles, this is beautiful. And I can see we're coming into this the gardens, how, how many acres, you know, I always have to speak in acres as the American gardens do you have here? Sure, so about 20 acres of gardens here. Incredible. And uh, you've picked the most brilliant day to come, you really <laughs> have. Yeah. I, so, I do that, I do that. So Luke and I have always said, oh my gosh, Athel Hampton, our neighbors, they are the first net zero and I'll follow it up with castle because I'm the American in any big manor house, I always think of a castle, but this is true. You've been able to achieve something that not very many people have been able to, and in particular in a grade one listed house. I think you're, you're right. And we're, I mean, we're very pleased to be able to do this. Yeah. So where are we entering into right now, Giles? So this we're is the kitchen garden now. And a lot of the produce for the cafe comes from here. Fantastic. And, um, well, I had a delicious, uh, I have to say, jacket potato. I haven't had one. Uh, in quite some time and I was very pleased. It really warmed me up, so. <laughs> very good, very good. Kudos to the chef. But we're now heading somewhere that is a part of this net zero project that began how many years ago? Uh, so it began nearly three years ago now, actually, yes. I'm gonna show you something that helped produce that jacket potato <laughs> that you had. It's fantastic. Well, but here, of course, is an enormous greenhouse. Yes, indeed. <sighs> I shall step inside because I know it'll be lovely and oh, warm in here. Oh, it's lovely and warm, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, great for growing the tomatoes for the cafe and so on. Wonderful. Come on through here and I will show you that. You have to duck your head. Yeah. There we yeah. go. Ooh, I get to go into the no entry the zone. No entry zone. The no yes, entry zone. Exactly. Very lucky, yeah, very yeah, lucky. Yeah. You can come too, everybody. <laughs> yes, exactly. And here we are. Oh. The solar panels, yes. My goodness. Yes. Oh my goodness, so, this is extraordinary. This is unbelievable. And how clever that, you, I mean, you would never guess that these were here. I, I couldn't see them from anywhere in the garden. Nowhere could I see them. They're, they're just invisible, exactly, yeah. I mean, I don't know what the right question to ask. Do I ask how many solar panels you have or what are you producing? Well, tell me. So these combined with some that we have in the field around the corner produce uh, at maximum 130 kilowatts in right. the middle of the day. Yes. And across the year as a whole, we're producing nearly 140 megawatt hours of electricity. That is a serious amount of right. electricity. Yes. Is that and, and that. OK. Can, how close can you get to these? Can yeah, I, can we I, can come up can and I, can, can absolutely, <laughs> you can come and touch them if you want. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And oh, fact, can I? Well, okay, great. We have to do that occasionally anyway, just if they, I mean, normally they're okay, but occasionally they just get a bit dirty. So. Uh, oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah. Look at, and they're warm. Yeah. Of well, they are. of course they, they are. are. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely and warm. This is magical. Okay. Giles, I have so many questions and I think many people watching this program will have questions as well. First and foremost, you know, you, you came to Athel Hampton in 2019, so not that long ago. Yes. It was, I, presumably it was heated how, and electricity was the normal way, is that right? So, so what we had, we had gas tanks, yes. LPG tanks, yep. and that was by far the biggest source of power for a lot, and we had lots of gas boilers, which needed a lot of maintenance, and, uh, and then there was a small oil-fired Arga, Yes, yes, and, we have, still have that. Yep, <laughs> and, and then we had a, for emergencies, we had a diesel generator. Okay. A great sort of big beast of a thing. Okay. Um, and so all of that has gone. All, all of that has, has gone. gone. All of it has gone. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And what was your inspiration for this project? Uh, well, and, and taking this here, and especially in a grade one listed house. I mean, did you know coming in, you thought, right, this is something I want to do. You had an idea around that. 
or was it once you lived here for a bit you thought hold on this is not sustainable I'm going to get ahead of the curve it did not make sense to be burning all that fossil fuel and just really you know having a kind of rather old inefficient system yes. and why not put in something brand new that actually uses the new technologies and is zero emissions and we you know that that 140 megawatt hours is enough across the year to cover everything we need at Athelhampton everything which is the heating the cooking in the commercial kitchen lighting light oh. uh, even charging the occasional car so no it is it's, it is great that yeah. is incredible so yeah. Okay, I'm just going to, I know that this is a silly question, but I am going to ask it because I know what the answer is, but I just want to hear it from Giles. Is, so you do not receive any electricity bills or gas bills? So for the <laughs> Athelhampton house yes. and the gardens and the cafe, we, we get a bill in the middle of winter and then we get money back uh, in the summertime. Okay. Um, net, in carbon terms, yes. we actually are genuinely neutral because the, 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 what we're drawing down in the middle of winter is a little bit technical, but it comes in the middle of the night right. when the grid is very low carbon. Yes, yes. Um, in terms of actual money, we pay a tiny bit because unfortunately what they, they don't give us as much back for each unit that we put back in as we buy from right. them. I see. Which, I see. you know, I can grumble about, but at yeah. the end of the day, it's tiny. It's, it, it's tiny compared to what exactly. we are in, in, in yeah. now, the, yeah. the electricity yeah. and, and the gas prices. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's tiny. And also, you're heating and, and lighting electricity, uh, a grade one listed house, a very big manor house, and you've got your cafe. Yes. So, yes. you know, without this, that bill would be enormous. It would be horrendous. And yes. then, I mean, as I'm sure you know, then, of course, what you end up, you have to, is you turn the thermostats right down or off. Yes. And then that's not so good for the fabric of the poor building. No. Not nor for the fabric of the poor people, <laughs> but that's another matter. But yes, uh, no. That is, oh my goodness, it's incredible. But this, my understanding is this is just one, I'm seeing just one part of the project that you implemented. Is that right? That's right, yes. So the, the solar, this is all drawing it in from this beautiful sun. Exactly, yep. yep, yep. And then what happens? So this then is going to go to the heat pumps, which is what creates the heat and the hot water for, to actually keep the house warm. Okay, should we head there let's and look at those? Let's go and have a look okay, at those. Let's yeah, look at those. Let's head off. This is so clever, and especially in a grade one listed building and garden. So now we're going to look at the heat pumps. Oh. And the, the heat pumps here are being, <gasps> they're being powered by the, by the solar power that we've just I seen. I see, so you've got solar power where we were just at in the kitchen garden. Yes, exactly. Coming all the way underground. Underground, of course. Right, yes, underground, yes. up through here. Yes. Now explain to me their purpose so I can get my head around so this. So these incredible. machines, and you may be able to feel it, they're a bit like an inverse air conditioner. Yes. And um, so what they're doing is they are draw. yes, this one is, is going, you can feel it pumping out air. Oh, yes. So this draws in uh, air at one temperature and it pumps it out at a lower temperature. Okay. And it extracts the heat from, from the air. Okay, so these two are working in tandem. Oh, yes, well, uh, the it, system, the kind of computer right, turns right. on and off as many yes. as it needs okay, at any given okay. moment. Oh my goodness. Yes, so, so they're using the solar power to extract, in effect, heat from the air, which is rather clever. Oh my goodness. This is some serious technology here. It's, it's it, good, it, isn't This it? is yes. very good. Yes. And you and have, yes. it looks like you've got sort of, t what is this, 10? We've got 10 here, here. yes. Oh, there's, and then so there's, there's another bank over the other side. And you're very, <laughs> it's very clever, Giles, because they're hidden away from view. Well, that is essential. And I mean, obviously you can see we're, we're very close to even the Elizabethan part, the Tudor yes. part of the house, but they really are tucked away in this kind of, you know, grotty area where we would just had dustbins or something. Right, you before. would have had exactly, so exactly. Nobody can see them, um, but here they are, nice <gasps> and close to warm up. The nice house. and yeah. wow. Okay, yeah. so this now is 
heating, ta the, taking what would be discarded usually, recycling it, if yes, you like, yes. heating, and then there's another step, isn't there? Right. So, so, yes, so this goes through one more kind of thing that looks a bit like a boiler, and then, of course, it has to come into the house. Yes. And in a, in a kind of old-fashioned, say, a gas boiler, you'd be heating the house through radiators. Yes. And we are doing that to some extent, but we're also making a lot of use of underfloor heating, and we've even Wonderful. repurposed some of the old grills that were put in in the Victorian era. So I'd love to see inside then, now sort of the end product, if you like, yes. it coming up through the grills, yep. and this heat that I've just seen that's being extracted and pumped in at no cost. Let's, <laughs> let's come and look, let's come and look. Now, I have to say, I did notice these yes. before when we were in here having our Elizabethan lunch. Let's, let's have but, a good look at oh them, shall we? Oh my goodness, yeah. yes. So these are the original Victorian grills. Fantastic. So these, uh, during the Victorian period, th then of course, were to heat the hall that we're in right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Heated by coal. By coal, like coming up as we know. Through. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then when you came in, this had then, was this being used at all as a heat source? They, they kind of modernized it, I don't know, 30 years ago with a very clunky old uh, system. Right. And so barely working, I would say. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that now you've, you're piping it up through and the heat's coming up. Exactly. So what is coming up from here is actually the heat that's being produced by those, those air source pumps that we were just looking at. Yeah, fantastic. So as far as the sort of architectural design of all of this and where the piping's, the pipe was coming through, that was already, the infrastructure was already there. It was, in one sense, it was replacing, is that right? That is it's absolutely true here, here in the Great Hall. Okay. But as you went through the rest of the house, in some places, maybe there were old radiators, which we could use one or two of, but mainly had to upgrade, but also, we decided on another solution in some places, which was to remanufacture these grills and put them in other rooms. Ah, okay. Instead of having the wall radiators. Exactly. Much so, prettier. Much prettier. Yeah, yeah. Giles's innovative thinking and vision is shared by co-mastermind Stefan Pittman, who met me in the powerhouse of the whole project. So I walked through, you know, a lot of this project that you and Giles uh, did together. I've seen the solar panels, I've seen yeah. the, I call them air conditioners, but they're not, yeah. but- and Heat pumps, yeah. Heat pumps, and, but now we're here and so, just remind everybody who's watching yeah. again, these, it's almost as if you're, tell me if I'm wrong, but it's almost as if you're almost like your own electric company? Uh, well, grid? yes, you're, so we're generating electricity from the solar panels, okay? Now, obviously that's only at a certain peak of time. Yes. Um, and that changes throughout the year. Yes. And your demand changes throughout the year as well. So in the summer, for example, it's generating more energy than it usually would use. Right. And rather than that just be sent back to the grid, it's storing, storing it in it. these. I see. And then when that generation declines, as that decline becomes to a level that the, the estate needs more, the batteries start trickling in. Um, oh my goodness. And that's how it balances it out. And that, I see. The first 12 months of this system up and running, it's used uh, it drew nine and a half megawatts of electricity from the grid, but sent back seven megawatts. Right. So that's a, so that's a difference of two and a half megawatts, right. which is smaller than most three bed semis. Right, right. Um, and beforehand, you know, that was just massive. It was way beyond any of these numbers. So, so ultimately, these batteries are offering that balance. Yeah, they're offering because the balance. It's a 12 bed, significant Tudor, uh, manor house, largely single glazed, etc. I understand Giles has gone through all the upgrades we did inside the house. We've got the coach house, which is grade two star thatch building, 
other than the fact there's no insulation there. Right, you know, right. There's, there's River Cottage, which is similar. There's outbuildings and, and sort of all the grounds um, and estate needs there. And within all of that, the energy usage from the grid is less than a three bed semi detached house. Unbelievable. So, Unbelievable. That is incredible. Yeah. It's, right there. It's quite impressive. It's, it's really impressive. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and all those, you know, sort of aspects you just said single glazed, there's not double glazed on yep. it. You're talking about no, a five, insulation, no in insulation, a 500 year old yeah. house. And same goes for the coach house, the thatched yeah. roof restaurants who now, yeah. um, you know, uh, yeah. The, the cost to heat those buildings right now without this would be astronomical. Oh, absolutely, you'd be looking at six figures easy. Yep, six uh, figures, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Well, thanks, Stefan, this is fantastic. So Not thank all. you for taking the time. Nice what to a meet brilliant you. project, so nice to meet you. How amazing to think that until 2020, 100 tons of carbon were emitted annually at Athelhampton. And the aim of this project is to cut carbon emissions to zero. Giles has, of course, made a massive investment, but what is so inspiring and also rewarding is the long-term benefit to the environment. Now, what's fascinating for me as an American, to be perfectly honest, is that always it seems like you know when you go to these historic houses yes, yes. there is the history the fabric the architecture the yep, inside the yep, stories yep. but then of course you get to walk outside you do and yes. there's usually a fantastic garden of is course. that right yeah, no, they, they go together <laughs> they really do yes yeah yes. and the and you know the english love their gardens yes, don't they yes yes absolutely they do and here, of course, I've heard so much about the gardens here at Athelhampton. So yep, you're going to yep. give me a tour, is that I right? I will do, yes. I will show you. Come on, come on through here. Wow. And this, this we call it the Corona. It sounds a bit bad given <laughs> what we've all been through, but it's, it's probably very it's popular a, it's now. A, it's a crown, and you can see these, these uh, little pyramids round, yes. um, or obelisks forming this crown. And this is really, this circular, this small circle is the, the heart of the Athelhampton Garden. Fantastic. And w the, the garden, has it evolved over the years? And uh, obviously it has, but can you give me a little bit of history around it? Of course. But right. the designer was a man called Inigo Thomas. Um, and he was an amazing man, real thinker and designer, um, architect and so on. And he drew inspiration from the Renaissance, from the Elizabethan right. era. He drew it all together. And he had this idea of rooms, of outdoor rooms. Okay. And so this is the room as it were at the heart no. of the outdoors. And right. And we can go into each of the little doorways around oh. the edge. Okay. And, well, and in fact, we've just come through one, which is, right. is the, where, of course, in front of the house where you would arrive and that links us to the house. And now, if you so like, which, we can which come room through. are well, we going to? Let's come it's here to, to, to what we sometimes call the private or the east garden here. Oh, it is stunning. Look at this. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Oh, and then you just have this fantastic view from you, the back of the house. Exactly. Absolutely yep. wonderful. And overall, how long? Because when I, Matt Britton, I know our Italian eight gardens took yes. seven years, 1920 to 1927. Right. And these gardens okay. here, yes. what was the length? So I think the, the initial stage, these, these outdoor rooms that we're going through now, were built very quickly, actually, in oh, about right. perhaps two years. Oh, wow. And it was a massive effort. They, they had to shift 40,000 kind of tons of earth, which sounds an extraordinary amount. Yes, it does. And yes, indeed, they had to demolish some old farm buildings because the house had, had actually kind of become a farmhouse and it was being converted back to become a mansion. Right. So there was lots of work, but they just really, shall we come this way this around? This is enormous. Now, yes, isn't oh, this amazing? <laughs> this yeah. is amazing. The Great Court. Oh, yeah. so this room is called the Great, Great Court. Great Court, yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Now these yeah, the, these are you. Yeah, tell me about these pyramid well, views. You see, I think Inigo Thomas put these here because if you look at pictures of old Elizabethan gardens, they often had yes. view pyramids. 
but now mostly they were kind of sort of knee high to a grasshopper. They were sort of down here somewhere or rather. And of course, over the years, these ones have just got bigger and bigger <gasps> and bigger. Look at this. Yes. And, and is this the, this is their peak or is there a potential that to they could? To be honest, I think they're now big enough. Big. Okay. And <laughs> if anything, we'd love to just perhaps make them not quite so big. That is, that's a tall order. But yeah, no, yeah, I think they're is. a lovely size now. <gasps> they they're are, yep, this yep. is beautiful. Yeah. And then we made our way to Giles' favorite room, the Mediterranean Garden, where tea was waiting for us. And it's my favorite because it's a bit of a sun trap at almost every time of year. Right. And um, in summertime, we might come and have a cocktail here before oh, supper. Sounds good. Uh, but obviously now it's winter and we perhaps want something a bit warmer and it's the middle of the day. <gasps> so we've got, we've got a cup of tea for you oh, here. <laughs> so, sensational. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eucalyptus. You, uh, oh my goodness, this is fantastic. Yes, yes. Absolutely fantastic. I can see why this is your favourite part. This yes, is, I, I'm yes, afraid, yes. I'm going to have to agree with you. Yes. I think, I mean, I love the great court. Yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong, but there is just something spectacular about this tree. Yes. Eucalyptus. Yes. And then brought us some tea. Cup of tea, yeah. Well, brilliant. Yes. Do you yep. know what? We do have the sun and it is, it is, when you look at it, it Please. is rather warm. Yeah. Brilliant. So, oh, cheers. Welcome, cheers. Thank you, yeah. Giles. What <laughs> an absolutely spectacular garden. So, Giles, you know, I just wanted to ask now that we're sort of sitting out here, having a cup of tea, relax, the sun is on us. You became the custodian of Applehampton in 2019. And what was it that really drew, because this is a big project. Oh, you know, sure. This is not like, I'm just going to buy a, a large modern house and have all the modernizations and it's much easier to restore, repair, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But what inspired you to say, right, I want to be a custodian of, you know, a home that's well over 500 years. In, I, in history. Yeah, and, and I mean, you're, you know, you know better than almost anyone what a big project and how much is involved. So, of course. But I think the answer is, I mean, it, it's a, I, I think uh, it, it's just almost like falling in love. I mean, it is an amazing place. Yes. And if one's lucky enough to, to have that opportunity, very difficult to, to, to not be tempted by that. It right. is just extraordinary here. And I think it's because it's not just that you've got a wonderful old house it's that you've got all the amazing history all the people who've been connected with it down history and right up to the present day i That's mean the right. wonderful people who work here and who know it yes all the visitors who come people who've been married here um all that and that and then of course the gardens just stunning yes so, yeah. no and you've put it so eloquently because that's exactly how i feel it's about the stories past, but also the stories present and the community that these houses still retain, but in a different way. Yes, so, yes. you know, when we look back 100, 150, 200 years ago, and, and of course in, in Apple Hampton's case, well over 500 years ago, the community was very much tied in. Yes, But that's true. we as custodians now, our community is a much wider reach because it's the public. We're saying, come and enjoy yes. what we we want to share with you yes. and yes. it's it's sort of making sure that those invisible walls that were once up hundreds of years ago are completely down and it's that shared history and story um, and I think that's what's so wonderful. No I couldn't agree more and I think as well as physically inviting people in or allowing them to see over over you know video and whatever it is also about showing people the history yes. and understanding how people lived in the past and so on. Yeah. That's and, all part and of it. Of course it is, and how we've evolved. Yes, <laughs> very much so. Um, this is, I'm thinking at one point, when it gets warmer, Giles, I might have to invite myself back, and I'm going to tell you, I'm usually a beer drinker. However, because I am a lover of Italy, Mediterranean, I would have an Aperol spritz with you. Would you do that with me that next time I come like back? That sounds like a deal. It <laughs> sounds like a deal, yeah. All yeah. right, Aperol spritz it is, everybody, the next time we return.